Howdy, everybody. Uh, this is the ShareBrain channel inaugural stream, I guess. My name is Jared. Uh, I'm going to be hacking on various electronics projects. Uh, I've got a pile of projects as long as my arm, and I don't seem to be getting any of them done. And I figure if I do a stream and I have people interested, like actively interested in what I'm doing, um, that might be motivating. There might be a certain amount of accountability and people poking at me like, hey, what are you doing on this project? Uh, and I figure it'll be a good thing for getting stuff done. So uh, I'm going to give this a shot and see how it works. Uh, the topics I'm going to cover are going to be largely retro computing um, and retro telecommunications. And I guess my music tastes are kind of retro now, too. So retro music. Uh, but I'm probably also going to fiddle around with software defined radio because that's something I know a lot about and figure I can probably teach people some, some useful things about. Um, the intention is to stream um, work sessions and maybe build a community of people who want to participate in those different projects. Uh, but then to just try and distill down efficiently so it doesn't take all my time into little videos that I post on like YouTube or something that won't take a lot of people's time, but keep them involved in the project. Um, so with all that said, uh, I've chosen only five, um, hopefully short projects that I'm going to start working on. Um, because the list is much longer than that, I figure if I can cross off a number of really short projects really quickly, it'll feel good. Uh, it won't be too much for people to to chew on. So it'll it'll sort of establish the sorts of things that I like to work on. And then I can start diving into larger projects later on once I get more comfortable with doing this whole streaming thing. So um, let's see, first thing on my list is not the th first thing that I have set up in front of my cameras here. Um, so let me switch around here a little bit. Uh, the setup is not ideal. I've got a microphone over here and I've got all of the sort of overhead camera stuff over here, which means if I lean over and start fiddling with stuff, I get far away from the microphone. But hopefully you can still hear me when I do this. Oh yeah, another thing is my chair is really creaky. And they're building a fence outside. Sound is not ideal, but, you know, we'll work on it. Okay. So, boink. I said boink. There we are. These are some weird little Intel chips from the late 70s, early 80s that basically represent like an alternate universe for... Um, our modern future. Um, Intel worked on a completely different computer architecture from what we live with today, and their intention was for that to be what we use today, except the project had a lot of issues and it kind of failed. Um, I happened to be extraordinarily lucky, but I didn't realize it at the time, to come into a bunch of these systems that were being scrapped. And I kept what I thought were the cool, funky looking chips, not even having any idea what historic value they had. They just look cool. Uh, these, these three have been um, decapped, so there's no lid on them. You can see the chip itself. Obviously, when that happens, usually the chip gets damaged at some point and it doesn't really function. Uh, in fact, a lot of the die wires are broken, so these chips aren't usable. But I've got, I don't know, like 40 or 50 more of these that are have their caps on and presumably work. So my plan is to try eventually to build a working system around these chips, which is not a trivial undertaking. But um, first step is you can see they don't, <laughs> they're not like dip chips that you can just plug into a standard socket. They're super weird. Um, and so we need a socket. We need something to mount these so that we can attach them to a circuit board and make use of them. The unfortunate thing is that the pin spacings are kind of awkward. Um, the Vertically, they're 100 mils apart, so a tenth of an inch, but there's two rows of them and they're 70 mils apart. And so you can't just take two, row, two like um, pin headers or pogo pin headers or pogo pin strips and just line them up because uh, they're too close. So um, me and uh, somebody on Twitter named Bruhaha, we're about the only two people who are interested in this 
particular computer architecture. He has some hardware and he's been working on slowly trying to build a system around these chips. And he's got some work done and he has some ideas about how to do it. And we've kind of negotiated like, or not negotiated, <laughs> uh, bounce ideas back and forth. And I think we're kind of heading in the same general direction, but I would really like to find a way to make a socket that relies purely on uh, printed circuit board manufacturing. Like I'd love to be able to just order a little panel of PCB stuff and maybe stack it up and then plug a bunch of P um, standard off the shelf pogo pins into it and have a functional socket. Um, he's taking a slightly different route where he's having somebody CNC uh, kind of a, a like a guide or, a, or a, something that these fit into. And I'm kind of hoping I can do away with that and instead use printed circuit board material. Uh, I should probably be looking at chat to make sure I'm not missing cool questions. Uh, yeah, this is, they are really cool looking. Uh, in fact, <laughs> this is embarrassing because only recently have I understood how interesting these chips are. When I originally parted these systems out in the 80s, I took these three chips and turned them into earrings for my mom. Uh, so she was wearing extraordinarily rare computer chips from an alternate universe. Uh and uh, it's just embarrassing. Uh, I really wish I could go back in time and get those computer systems and save them. I didn't save any of the software. All that, all that stuff got tossed. And so there's no, there's really no software out there for these things either. So um, Bruhaha knows a lot about the software side of things and has also done a, a reverse engineering on the microcode in these chips. So I think there's some hope that we may be able to run some kind of code on these eventually. I also have the fortune of living in the place, the Portland area in Oregon, the state of Oregon in the United States, where these chips were designed. And I personally know, let's see, at least two people who work directly on the project and through those people, several more. And hopefully um, that will be a benefit to this project. So far, it hasn't yielded a lot of results, but I'm working on that. Uh, chat, chat, chat. Um, yeah, they did make really cool looking earrings, <laughs> definitely. Um, the castellations are offset, so that's the tricky part. Hey, TNT, aren't you supposed to be going to sleep now? <laughs> you, you just did a five hour live stream. Come on. Um, though, those might work except for the fact that they're offset. Um, I suppose you could just not use every other one, and if they are narrow enough, then maybe that would be a way. Uh, um, do you know if Milmax makes them? I, I should, I'll look it up. You don't have to stay up answering my questions. I'll look it up. Um, flex PCB is also interesting. Um, I would kind of like to prevent or avoid soldering to these because they have these nice, beautiful gold edges. And I'd kind of like to preserve that and not get a lot of solder on them. I don't know how, if, if it's possible to clean lead or lead free solder off of gold very easily. But I guess I just kind of ruled that out, assuming that it would be troublesome. Because I really want to, I don't want to mess with these things or damage them because they're so rare that uh, I want to keep them pristine if at all, all possible. Uh, and I'm, I'm not too concerned about prices. Um, you know, this is going to be very much a one-off sort of thing. We're going to build maybe one or two working systems. So if, you know, it costs us $100 for pogo pins, that's fine. Um, you know, I just want to get it done without having to spend too much time trying to find the cleverest and cheapest solution because we're only going to make, you know, like four sockets. Uh, oh yeah. Another interesting thing about these chips is that they come in pairs. So the processor is not a single chip. It's two chips. Uh, one has sort of the microcode and instruction decoder, and the other one actually has the execution unit and the ALU and all that stuff. Uh, oops, my monitor just went dark. I'm going to want to see that. Something I need to remember for, remember for next time. Uh, anyway, I could keep going on and on about these, um, and in fact, I will in other streams. But for now, let's move on. Do, do, do. Oh yeah, so I am a big fan of the uh, Telecommunications Museum in Seattle. If, if you haven't been, go. It's amazing. Um, they inhabit two floors of a telephone switching office in... Um, it's a switching office that's near the Boeing Field Airport in Seattle. And there's actually an operating like live 
modern day switching system in, on another floor, but then the two floors are above are where the museum is. And in that museum, they have working um, Stroger switches and number one crossbar, number five crossbar. Uh, I think they're trying to get a three ESS up and running. So all of these enormous, complex, beautiful telephone switches. And when you go there, you walk amongst them and you can touch them and you can put calls through them. And the people who are volunteering there are amazing because you were talking to the people who are actually maintaining them. Uh, and they can tell you in endless detail um, about all of the vagaries and complications of trying to maintain these things. Uh, in fact, they have a great YouTube channel where Sarah and Astrid will go through the latest thing that they're doing with the switches or problems they're having with it. Um, and it's really cool to watch, at least if you're telephone nerdy like I am. Uh, so I think it was maybe a month ago, Sarah posted a video where they're talking about the number one crossbar and it has all these relays in it and they require these little phenolic spacers and they break because they're, I don't know, they're probably 70 or 80 years old at least at this point and nobody's making new ones. So at some point they're going to run out of them, uh, replacement ones, and they're going to have a number one crossbar that does not work, which would be a real bummer. So uh, I just messaged Sarah through YouTube and said, hey, could I take a shot at trying to make new ones? Um, so she sent me uh, an example and a little diagram, and I'll show you that. Oh, I forgot to switch back to my face cam while I was yakking. So you got to look at an empty table. Cool. Well, I'll learn. Um, let's see. Overhead, like this. There's the note, but we're going to look at this little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of phenolic first. Focus up. Come on. I don't know if I can hold my hand stable enough. Oh, too close. There it is. And I'll set it down. So one thing you'll note is that it is it has really tight internal angles. Uh, the corners are very tight. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, I've never tried to make a printed circuit board with internal angles that are that the radiuses are radii are so small. So um, I don't know if it'll be possible using a standard PCB manufacturer. So for scale, here's my thumb. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty small piece. Um, now I noticed that, for example, PCB Way has also got uh, CNC machining of phenolic. Again, I don't know how easily they would be able to machine those corners. I'm hoping maybe if the PCB thing doesn't work out, the CNC routing um, service that they offer will be able to, but I'm not so sure. Uh, and I'm hoping that someone has a clever idea in chat because I see some stuff. Do, do, do. Yeah, so it probably is punched. I don't know how... I was hoping that we could use a modern and very inexpensive method to, to produce these. Um, but, you know, if you have to resort to punching, then I will, as a you know third option, uh, resort to trying that. Although I, have, I don't know anything about doing that sort of thing. So that is the second project. Uh, I will probably attempt to draw it up in KiCad first and then send it to PCB Way or JLC PCB. I don't know who would be the better choice and see how much they bulk at trying to cut those corners. Um, I might just have some made even if they do bulk because then I could at least try and use a, like a, a file to tighten up the edges just to kind of make a one-off that is uh, an example that they can test in the number one crossbar and see if the dimensions are about right. Uh, but then if the PCB thing doesn't work out because they can't do the corners and then maybe we'll try the CNC uh, approach. All right, next project. Um, I, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago, uh, cathode ray tubes on AliExpress were kind of a hot topic. So I got this guy. Not the purple PCBs. 
So there were a couple of different varieties of these going around on AliExpress and people on Twitter were getting super excited about them. And so did I. Uh, I bought a bunch of them because I had a bunch of friends here in Portland who got super excited as well. So we're probably going to do some art projects and who knows what with these. Uh, so exactly what we're going to do, we don't know. But the first thing was to figure out if they were good and hook them up. Find some nice, secure, simple way to hook them up to, to other hardware. So I got one of these. I hooked it up to 12 volts. It consumes 12 volts at, I don't know, what is it, a third of an amp? So about four watts. And the picture was reasonably good. There was a bit of a geometric distortion that wasn't ideal, especially especially if you're going to display a video game or um, computer text on it. But, you know, good enough. And maybe because all this stuff is exposed, uh, I could poke around, trying not to shock myself, and figure out some way to improve the geometry a bit. Uh, but because we want to hook this up to real projects and experiment with them instead of just doing stuff on the bench, uh, I did a quick little PCB here. Uh, other camera. Doo, doo, doo. Focus up, please. Come on, you can do it. Or not. Maybe closer. Oh, what are you doing? Okay. There we are. Okay, so it's really basic. Um, it's a brightness potentiometer, uh, a DC jack, a capacitor for just sort of local uh, buffering of, of the voltage, and then a composite video jack. So really simple, uh, but I haven't populated it uh, or hooked it up yet. And once I do, then we can start experimenting with what we can actually do with these CRTs. Checking on chat. Uh, trying to do XY raster. Uh, I suppose there's enough electronics there that, well, so first of all, I think if you wanted to do that, oh, wait, XY, a raster. Oh, so you'd have to rewind the coils, I presume, to achieve that. And given how oddly shaped this thing is, I don't know how well it would work. <laughs> um, but, you know, they were cheap, and I suppose that's something we could experiment with. Um, so that's project number three. And then there's this guy. Scrape. Back to the other camera. Okay, so what this is, is it's a guitar pedal and it's made by Digitech. Actually, they made four different models, the XP 100, 200, 300, and 400. And if you look, not going to sit flat. Okay, fine. Fine. Um, what you see here is this the, a PCB that is shared between all four designs. And depending upon the model, they just populate one of the four RAM chips or all four, and they put a different EEPROM in the socket you see on the right. Now, you may be thinking, that doesn't look like an EEPROM because it isn't. Uh, I started working, I don't know, two or three years ago on this for a friend. A friend said, hey, I found this hack. Uh, and I have a couple of these pedals. Can you mod them for me? And I was like, yeah, sure. No problem. It should be easy. And then three years later, four years later, uh, I'm still working on it. I mean, I haven't been working on it. And that's part of the problem and why I'm talking about it here. But I did get a circuit board designed. And you can see on the other camera doo -doo -doo, that we have a modern flash chip that's 5 volt compatible and uh, an SWD port for programming a little microcontroller that's on the backside. Uh, it's a little Freescale uh, ARM processor. It's like a Cortex-M0 or M0+. Plus. I don't remember the exact designation, but it's really small. And the idea is to use this to hold f all four of the ROM images for the four different models of this guitar pedal, and then switch between them by sel selecting different address lines but also use the microcontroller to provide four different LEDs to indicate which model uh, this pedal is in, or which, which pedal model mode it's in at the moment, which firmware it's running, and then provide ni four nice chunky foot switches that he can use on stage to switch between the four different modes live. Um, there is the need to bounce a reset line in order to get the pedal to reboot, but it seems to reboot pretty quickly in my experiments. So as long as he 
plans out what he's playing so that he's got a second or two of downtime between switching modes. Uh, it should be pretty graceful to use live and switch between the modes, hopefully. So that's project number four. Oh, by the way, um, I'm not the person that came up with this mod. There's tons of people doing mods, um, including, let's see, I think I've got this queued up. That's me. That's the one I want. Uh, this is a giant PDF that somebody wrote in, I think, 2012 or 2014 that talks about doing exactly this sort of mod, except that they go and stack up the, um, <laughs> they stack up three EPROMs and then put a switch between it. I mean, it's simple and it works, but it offends my sensibilities terribly. So that's why I'm off on this tangent. Uh, I just couldn't bring myself to do that. <laughs> Okay, so that's number four. Uh, last one. Um, and this one's kind of a, hopefully a, a nice simple one. Uh, but it's because uh, the project is necessary because I was impatient and I did something dumb and I don't understand chemistry. So let's go back to the table. And I'm going to pull out my Compact Portable 3 computer. It's a chunk. Yeah. Okay. And maybe zoom out a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's a Compact Portable 3 computer. It's in kind of a state of disassembly because I tore it completely apart and cleaned it and put it back together partially. And then I got to the screen. Uh, so the, the screen is actually, um, I think it's, it's not plasma. Um, it's not fluorescent, uh, like electroluminescent. No, that's not right. I don't remember exactly what the technology is or the term, but it's the beautiful orange display. And it has a plastic cover over it, and it has a nice compact logo. And I saw there were some weird um, little specks on it, and I thought, oh, I should clean those off. And I tried cleaning them off using, uh, you know, Windex, and then I tried some alcohol. And then eventually I tried... <clears throat> acetone and that was a terrible idea so <laughs> you can see what I did to it I'm so ashamed <laughs> this is terrible um, but by happy coincidence somebody that you all might be familiar with Mighty Ohm aka Jeff Kaiser happened to be fixing a piece of test equipment that he bought that had a scratched up display and he mentioned that this stuff worked out really well for him so guess what i bought a um, trial pack or not a trial pack a um, starter pack and i'm going to give it a shot and see if i can polish out some of this the blemishes so from what i can tell using acetone caused um basically it, it's it crazed the surface and caused a bunch of cracks that are hopefully very superficial and should be very easy to polish out. I'm really hoping that's the case because otherwise I have, you know, <laughs> I've messed up uh, an otherwise very nice retro computer by being stupid and not understanding chemistry. Um, that said, I, I did go and scan this thing in my flatbed scanner just to get uh, a nice image of it because it does have the compact logo on it. And worst case, I'm almost sure that I can get... Um, I can basically reprint this out of a new piece of plexiglass if I need to, or even hand paint it if I'm feeling extra crazy. So it's not the end of the road, but I would really like to be able to finish or refinish this to the point where I can use the original plastic and not have to deal with that. So um, yeah, that's five projects that I'm gonna live stream here in the next few weeks. Um, who knows, maybe even in the next week um, and Hopefully these will turn out well uh, and benefit the people for whom I'm doing the projects. <laughs> um, so let me know, you know, what of all of this sounds interesting. If you have any thoughts on how to do stuff, I already see there's tons of stuff in chat, so that's cool. Um, I'm excited to catch up on that and see what I can learn from it. Um, and in the meantime, I will say goodbye and have a good day.